the Valor is best understood, I think, as the Tudor Doomsday Book. Um, so it's an audit of the property and income of all church institutions, not just monasteries, all church institutions. It's intended above all, first and foremost, simply for Henry to understand what is the um, scale of this thing, the church in England, that he has now effectively become chief executive of. What would I have seen if I'd walked past my local monastery in the 1530s? The Valor tells you, and, and it will tell you that there were in that field over there, there were 200 sheep, and over there was a water mill, um, and the person who rented that land was so-and-so. And in some parts of the country, you can follow a direct line from what was recorded in the Valor to what street names, field names, farmhouse names are even today. Um, so it's, it's a wonderfully rich record. So much of what happens in the 1530s has been compressed into a sort of high political story. And I, I'm really passionate about actually turning that on its head and saying, no, what, what really is of value to anyone who wants to know their, their history is what these episodes tell us about the communities in, in the kingdom. And um, uh, we, we need to... We, we, I dare, I dare to say we've had enough of Henry and his emotional turbulence and, and, and we've, we've probably done to death Henry and Cromwell. Um, so let's allow ourselves the moment to actually understand what it meant for people in different localities. We're probably still dealing with the repercussions of such a huge change that, that everything that set in motion. Um, and, and we had to put back in certain ways. If you think about our National Health Service, our, yeah, it, all that, the, the, the uh, schools, all of that had to be well, lost and then recreated. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Um, uh, the institutions that are not themselves monastic, but that were under the authority um, and financial um, support of, of monasteries, um, certainly schools, a number of hospitals um, uh, are extinguished as monasteries close. Um, and then there are other forms of social welfare. Um, uh, it's said even by um, city authorities, um, uh, mayors write to Cromwell when it becomes clear that the friaries are going to close in 1538. They say, you must understand what role these places perform in um, meeting different social needs. Um, the, the mayor in um, Coventry talks about the fact that in time of plague, um, it's the friaries that open up their gates to let, uh, uh, to let people in. Um, uh, which actually, um, even then, they understood um, had the effect of actually containing the, the spread um, of, of pestilence by, by um, effectively creating a, a, a sort of quarantine um, area. So these um, sort of ancillary social um, contributions that these institutions make, then yes, in... Um, the later Tudor period and onward have to be made again in, in different ways. And there's no doubt that when in Elizabeth's reign, there is a crisis over the um, rising problem of vagrants, of the, the dependent poor, um, of famine and so on, that the, the removal of these institutions and their infrastructure has been part of the problem. And in that respect, I think for the possibly for the normal everyday person, that is the big reason that you couldn't believe that these institutions would go. Not the, you know, religious uh, sort of very high level, really, arguments that are being made. It's the, well, what are we going to do when the play comes around again? What do we do? Yes, absolutely. Um, or um, 
I've been renting this this um, property in in the high street for years, and I actually took it on from my parents who were renting it before me. And now I'm told that um, there's going to be a new landlord. Um, is the rent going to go up? Um, and nine and a half times out of ten, it does go up. Um, uh, or I've been selling my trade goods to that large monastery um, and I was doing very well out of it um, and now there's no market for what I'm trading at. and um, anyone trading in in foodstuffs in um, in wine in small manufactured goods you can imagine a large institution um, maybe 50 monks 150 staff if you were trading in leather goods or small metal goods or wine um, or meat, um, then the loss of that large institutional market would just um, bring you to your, your knees because there would be no instant replacement to that. Um, uh, just like um, if you imagine a, a, a smallish provincial town today that might have a, uh, a university in it, um, if if that university with twenty thousand students suddenly disappeared, the local economy would would take the most extraordinary hit. Um, uh, I know in my own university city that getting a taxi in the summer when the students aren't here and the taxi drivers are, 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 are morose because they're not um, they're not benefiting from bringing people to and from uh, uh, parties like they do during term time, um, uh, and it's. The economy is in the doldrums until the students come back. Um, uh, the trouble with with the closure of these institutions is that the economy then, in some places, was permanently in the doldrums um, and would have to find a new um, a new form of livelihood. There's a, a famous description which I I use in the book from the uh, reign of Elizabeth for the the small town of Walsingham in Norfolk, which up to the closure of the monasteries was a town for uh, that was attracting hundreds and hundreds of pilgrims every year to the um, uh, the shrine of um, the Virgin Mary in the in the priory with the closure of the priory and the tearing down of the shrine the pilgrims don't come anymore and it's only 30 years later where um, it's said that the town has had to completely reinvent itself um, and one of the um, things they've done is to turn to um, growing crocuses um, for saffron um, um, in the fields around the town. And how remarkable this, this, this turns from being essentially a sort of tourist town. Pilgrims, after all, were kinds of tourists. And it's had to find a different economy. Um, and that must be played out in so many parts of the country where the old economy has gone. Um, and, and of course, some towns never quite do reinvent themselves um, uh, because it may be that they can't find an alternative that is of the same scale of economic activity that the, the monastery had brought them. Um, and it must have an arresting effect on the, the growth of the town and on the population. And there's no doubt that some towns over time um, dwindle in size because because that institution has gone. Yeah, we shouldn't take for granted when we see the ruins of an abbey in the middle of the countryside, seemingly next to nothing, that that was always the case. No, indeed. No, indeed. Um, and I think particularly where you've got this very picturesque landscape, um, you might go to um, Tintern Abbey in, in Monmouthshire or uh, Riveau Abbey in, in North Yorkshire. Um, actually, both of those places, um, just before the dissolution, we know, um, were um, beginning to develop um, mineral industries. So um, iron working um, at Tintern and um, coal mining um, at Riveau. Um, but now you, you walk through this sort of romantic landscape. Um, and, and no, you're quite right. Um, and I have to say, I, I think sometimes heritage organisations don't um, don't tell that part of the story. I, I actually think that um, 
uh, we we do a disservice to to visitors. Um, I think visitors would like to know that had this institution lived on, we might have seen more industry in this area um, than we 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 actually do now. Um, it, it seems as if we want to press these sites into a kind of template of a romantic ruin. Um, but we um, we actually need to, to remind ourselves that um, far from it, it, the romantic ruin is itself an invention. They're not, um, that's something that since the 18th century, we, we wanted to fashion these places into. But um, uh, all forms of economic activity are um, either simply interrupted or at least diverted because this this end comes it's very interesting what you say there about ironworks coal works we could have had a maybe not quite so big an industrial revolution but the 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 sort of i don't know getting into that much much earlier than perhaps quite possibly i think it's it's really interesting that monasteries possibly were encouraging that because they're they are renting out the land on which this is happening but at very competitive rates because they um as big old institutions they they didn't tend to constantly revisit their their rates of rent but they would let out on quite long-term leases which of course allows an entrepreneur to actually take the risky uh step of some open cast coal mining or some um, uh, smelting of iron or, or, or whatever um, in a way that is more difficult perhaps immediately after the dissolution when these estates are broken up, new landlords come in who do want to hike the rent um, and, and that does act a, a, as a check on um, uh, new and more, more, more risky uh, ventures and um, yeah, we 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 don't remind ourselves enough. I think that that because of the the range and diversity of land that and property that monasteries held, um, they're not just sort of farmers. They are um, proprietors of land that is u- being used in a variety of different ways. Um, and uh, I th- I think. If not an earlier industrial revolution, I think we might have had a different one um, mm-hmm. if um, if they remain in place. And certainly we would have had a different urban economy um, uh, because um, actually what happens in a lot of towns and cities because of the breakup of the, the monastic institutions is that private ownership comes into the cities. And it's really only then much later into the 19th and 20th centuries that those private estates in the heart of cities are actually finally broken up. Um, if if large corporations had remained in, in cities, then yeah, things, things un, undoubtedly would have taken a different course. Um, and that's one of the fascinations about this subject, the, the sort of counterfactual approach. You know, if, if, if the dissolution hadn't happened, what kind of a Elizabethan England, what could we have looked at? Mm. Well, that's fascinating. We, we could, yeah, we could go down a complete <laughs> rabbit hole of that, couldn't we? <laughs> so let's, um, I'd like to talk about the practicalities of closing the these institutions, because that's another thing that comes across on the book, in the book. It, it, it seems to have been as unique as the house would have been itself we'll get on to talking a little bit before we finish about the people in, involved as well because again it just seems like every individual had a slightly different experience and maybe that's how come we've ended up with this sort of very summarized um view i think of the dissolution it's like any time a, sub- a subject is too nuanced or too complex or too large it seems to then turn the opposite way and it gets incredibly summarized so um Let's, so it, okay, so if if so, the the king's commission has come to to close a house. What's the actual process? What happens on the day? The first thing to say is that we don't have um, detailed descriptions of these moments, despite 
800 plus institutions being closed over the course of this period, um, uh, we are um, feeling our way with just hints and, and, and gestures. The, the one certainty is that there is a legal process at the heart of it. So um, the, for the, the larger institutions um, and for the friaries, um, so from those that are closed, 1537, 38, 39, um, the process is a legal one of surrender where the entirety of the corporation that is the monastery is given over by a legal document to the crown and it's if we understand a monastery to be a corporation a business if you like um throughout its history it's been issuing documents leases of land whatever um, this is the very last legal act that it undertakes um, and as far as we can tell they carry out this last legal act um, by gathering in their chapter house which is was always the, the the if you like the government house of a of a monastery institution um, and they agree to make this final act and then it is written out on a parchment document and that document is sealed with the seal of the house um, and then strictly speaking that seal is broken because the institution, the corporation, has been extinguished and can no longer operate as a legal entity, and so the seal must be broken. Whether it is broken, because there's a certain amount of um, funny business of acts and property leases and so on being issued after the monastery has come to an end, so probably they weren't always broken up and given in. But um, that legal act takes place. Then there is a very bureaucratic process of um, effectively um, presiding over the dismissal of the different inmates of the house. So the, the monks or the nuns um, are given small cash sums in order to enable them to... Um, past their first few days outside of the monastery um, uh, and to um, pay for um, clothing other than their habits. So small, very small cash sums. Those cash sums vary according to the wealth of the, the house. And if the house is in real debt, then uh, we know that the commissioners are struggling to know how to give them any cash at all. Um, and with the friaries where um, there's no cash, um, we know that the principal commissioner for the closure of the friaries is actually reaching into his own pocket because he writes complaining letters to Cromwell saying, look, I'm massively out of pocket because I keep having to go and effectively find some cash of my own to, to, to give these people something to go out of the house with. Um, then the same process is carried out with the, um, the staff, the domestic staff of the house. Um, they will get at least a portion of their wages paid. Um, and um, that's it. I mean, it's effectively like a sort of cash redundancy um, that you're, uh, you're getting. Um, and the final part of the process is to put the, um, the institution into a sort of what we might call, I suppose, a sort of mothballed state. Um, so there must be somebody local in whose custody the buildings, the site, are now going to be held. Because the commissioners are well aware that this is a prime piece of real estate, absolutely stuffed full of fixtures and fittings. Um, and the neighbourhood isn't just going to turn a blind eye to that, um, but people under cover of darkness are going to, you know, jam jemmy open the doors and start helping themselves to bits of architectural salvage. And we know that they do that. Um, so there is an effort to actually make arrangements, particularly with local authorities like mayors, aldermen, to um, local sheriff, constable, to try and make sure that the, the site is secure. Um, as the people are being dispersed, those um, 
furnishings that have some monetary value are um, appraised and then sold. And we do know that in some instances, um, a sort of date of a, of a sale, like a grand garage sale, is actually publicised in the locality so people can come along. Um, the, the main goods for sale off the premises like that are the things of highest value. So um, uh, precious metal plate, plated goods, um, uh, textiles. Um, monastery churches, priory churches are filled with vestments. Um, and these made from very, very fine fabrics, velvets, silks, cloth of gold, and so on, are highly, highly valuable um, and very saleable. Um, and it was familiar to buy these sorts of goods secondhand, make them into something else, whatever. So these things are sold. Um, in some cases, particularly for um, precious metals, um, valuers, specialist valuers are brought in to appraise them. And in small sites, all of this is happening pretty rapidly. Um, larger sites, of course, it's a matter of days, but the commissioners move quickly. And in fact, the um, some of the correspondence we have, there's, there's um, a letter I'm particularly attached to, which is a, from an abbot a few years later, um, who complains that the commissioners were far too quick and they went through the whole place like a dose of salts and... Um, Everything was left in a fair amount of chaos because they they were it was almost as if they they th were were saying to everybody you know we're we're not on double time here so we're going to get this thing done as quickly as we can and then we'll be off. Um, you do get the impression where we can make out their itineraries. You do get the impression that sometimes they were trying to get the thing done in an impossibly quick period of time, which is why you get people milling about. You get domestic staff saying hold on a minute, nobody ever came and gave me my wages. Um, and there's, so there's quite a lot of fallout afterwards where people, um, I'm, I quote in a book, I think there's um, in one house, the, the, the retained barber who'd been employed at the monastery um, comes out of the woodwork a year or so later saying, I'm still waiting for my wages. Um, nobody paid me when the, the whole place was closed down. And you, you get a, uh, a bit of that. I think the final thing to say is that, that the monks, the men and the friars, they do have to get a license in order to then go off into the world and act as an ordinary priest. Um, and they have to get a license from Canterbury, from the Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, and to add insult to injury, they have to pay for that license. Um, so some of them are left waiting around because they've paid for the license and it hasn't come yet. Some of them are left waiting around because they can't find the money to, to apply for the license, but they have to do it. And they, they do wait around for them because it's very difficult for them to go off and get work as a priest unless they're properly licensed. Um, and that's one reason actually that there are a good few of them around to join the rebellion in 1536, because we know in the investigation that happens afterwards, that a lot of monks in Lincolnshire were milling about waiting for their licenses. Um, and so when the rebellion breaks out, they're in, in situ because they've been waiting. And some of them are waiting for months, months and months and months. So they are literally in a kind of limbo. They're no longer monks. Um, they've only got a few coins. Um, uh, they may not be able to dress themselves properly as non-monks because they haven't got enough money and they're waiting for a license. So they're loath to move on. And again, in a highly provincial locality where communications are not good, you don't really want to move away from where you are because the person bringing your license may not be able to find you. So um, you can understand why people are literally sort of leaning against the now locked gatehouse waiting for somebody to arrive bearing a license so it's um it's about as messy a process you know um i suppose if you um sadly we sometimes see don't we when when a major factory or something is is shut down and people are 
are made redundant. You see people outside the gates of the factory waving their redundancy notices. We've got to imagine it's a bit like that. It, it seems incredibly messy as an entire process and then in the individual processes as well. So but we hear of people having pensions. Who gets a pension? And how come clearly then not everyone gets one? No, so the um, the smaller monasteries closed on the premise that they are not viable do not get pensions, except the heads of those monasteries. So they get pensions. Um, because, and, and in most cases it's more or less true, the income from those places would not have sustained a pension um, uh, for the lifetime of those, those people. Those then that are closed afterwards, so 1537, 38, 39, 40, that surrender themselves to the crown, which are the wealthier institutions, they do get pensions. The pensions are paid according to length of service, as everybody's pension is paid, after all. Um, except also the heads of the monasteries, abbots, abbesses, priors, prioresses, they get more because of the dignity, if you like, of their office, the significance of their office. Um, and there's a huge disparity. So some abbots get several hundred pounds pension, even though their monks will only get eight, 10, 12 pounds, something like that. So they will get um, very significantly more. Um, those who are very, very new recruits get very little. Um, so um, typically somebody who was just passing out of being a novice will get 40 shillings. So that's, um, that's two pounds, 20 shillings in a pound. Um, uh, quite often, those of sort of medium periods of service will get five or six pounds. Um, five or six pounds was around the sort of typical income of a parish priest in the in the reign of Henry VIII. Um, <clears throat> and there's clearly an understanding that five or six pounds is, as it were, a living wage for a, a priest. Um, so huge disparities. Um, and only those who are uh, undergoing closure in the later phase um, get them. Pensions are paid um, not in one annual sum, but um, across the year. And um, often we hear of um, the pensioners chasing arrears. So, um, uh, but having said that, the Crown is still paying them to the end of their life. And as I, um, I, I mentioned in the book, the last surviving pensioner is receiving their pension uh, in the reign of James I, which when we think that the last monastery closed in um, the spring of 1540, um, uh, more than 60 years later, we still have a pensioner living. Um, so the the liability, if you like, financially for the crown is, is quite a long one um, for this process. At what point do we see, or is it is it is it clear at all, the decision that everything is going to have to go? The catalyst, I think, and I argue in the book, really is a... Um, a sudden crisis of confidence that comes on Henry between 1538 and 1539. Um, and it's a crisis of confidence over how bought into his headship of the church uh, people really are. 